you mentioned uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, of course, now it's not so much in spotlight as more of the news concentrates on what is going on uh, between Israel, Hamas and the situation in the, in the Gaza Strip. So suddenly we see that Ukraine is not n- number one, at least not in the uh, foreign policy topics. Um, do you see any possible way out of the conflict? I mean, a peaceful way out or at least a satisfactory way out of this conflict. As you mentioned, um, this is really a proxy war, of course. The, the Ukraine is a pawn simply in, in, in the game. And in effect, it's a war of Russia against NATO, especially against the United States. So uh, is there a possible change, for example, coming with the next election in the United States? Or is it just wishful thinking? Well, the thing we should understand, if if you're playing poker and you have a lousy hand and uh, each time it comes to you, you raise the ante. And uh, when the opponent uh, matches you, meets your uh, meets you, you up the ante, even though your hand is lousy. Maybe you're bluffing or maybe you don't know how to play poker. But that is what the West has done with Russia. Because the West said, we're going to expand NATO to Ukraine. And at first, Russia didn't say, uh, oh, we're going to conquer the territory. Russia just said, don't do that. We respect Ukraine's borders. And all we want is a long-term lease for our naval fleet in Sevastopol. And that was what Viktor Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine, delivered between 2010 and 2013. A long-term lease for Russia and neutrality. Okay, we don't want to join NATO. It's, you know, we're in between. Then the United States and Europe really helped to overthrow Yanukovych. We should be clear about this. In February 2014, the United States played a direct role in the overthrow of Yanukovych. And they brought in an anti Russian government. And at that point, President Putin said, okay, we're not going to let Crimea fall into NATO hands. So we'll organize a referendum. And uh, the people of Crimea, no doubt, overwhelmingly were Russian and wanted to be part of Russia uh, and uh, voted to become part of Russia. The West said, no, this is completely unacceptable. Then uh, the Russian regions of eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, of course, said, uh, we don't like this new government. It's very radical. It's very anti-Russian. It's trying to cancel Russian culture and Russian language. We want autonomy, and the two breakaway republics of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, took place. And the Ukrainian government attacked them uh, as renegade provinces, but it militarily attacked them. And then came the Minsk agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II, to stop the fighting. And Minsk II, in particular, was endorsed by the UN Security Council. And Russia didn't say, we're going to take the Donbass. Russia just said, honor the Minsk II agreement, which gives autonomy to these regions and respect for the Russian language and Russian culture. Pretty reasonable, actually. But the Ukrainians and the Americans said, no way. We're not going to honor an agreement, even though the UN Security Council adopted it. And so Minsk II was never in, uh, implemented. And interestingly, uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany was supposed to be a guarantor of Minsk II. And then she admitted in a, in a press conference uh, a year ago, oh, We didn't really mean it. It just gave time for Ukraine to strengthen its defenses and so forth. Well, this is very cynical and very destructive. But the reason I mention it is Russia was not calling for Ukrainian territory. Except we raised the stakes in this poker game. And then Russia said, "Okay, we'll take Crimea. And the United States said, 
and we want autonomy for the Russian regions. No, no, no. We raise the stakes. No autonomy. And then Russia, okay, Russia said at the end of 1991, look, this situation is not controlled. Minsk is not being enforced. NATO is still intending to enlarge to Ukraine. This is the last chance we demand negotiations with the United States. And President Putin put on the table a draft agreement with the U.S. on December 17, 2021. And the United States said, no, we're not negotiating any of that with you. That's arrogance. They did it again. I called the White House at the end of 2021 and spoke with senior official and said, negotiate with Russia. Avoid the war. Oh, don't worry, Professor Sachs. Uh, and uh, of course, the United States rejected negotiations and the special military operation started. Now, this is also very interesting. At the time of the special military operation, the two regions, Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, claimed independence. Russia did not annex them until September 2022. Just, they claimed independence. Of course, the United States said no, but immediately Zelensky said, okay, okay, we can negotiate with Russia. And in March 2022, there were negotiations and they were actually going to reach an outcome of Ukrainian neutrality and an end to the war. And then what happened? The United States stepped in and said, no, don't do that. We don't accept that. Well, how stupid is that? You have a losing hand, but they raised the ante one more time. Now, why did they do that? Because they're basically ignorant. They, In this case, they didn't understand how bad their hand was. They looked at their cards and they said, we're going to impose economic sanctions, and this will bring Russia to its knees, and we will ship HIMAR missiles, and this will destruct, uh, destroy the uh, Russian military. This is a fantasy world of these people, these neocons in Washington. So they raised the stakes one more time. Uh, they said no to a negotiated peace. They said no to Ukrainian neutrality. And the war continued. And now where are we uh, in uh, this advanced stage of the war? Russia is absolutely destroying one Ukrainian army after another. This is obvious. And the much talked about uh, Ukrainian hyper uh, uh, counter offensive that was uh, supposed to take place in June 2023 and reach the Sea of Azov. Of course, it didn't reach anything. It didn't do anything other than kill tens of thousands of Ukrainians and cost an unbelievable amount of uh, money in destroyed tanks weapon systems, uh, artillery, uh, everything. So it's been a disaster. These are the worst poker players I've ever seen. Uh, all they do with a lousy hand is keep raising the stakes and keep losing. Maybe now they are trying to, to shift focus, shift attention to, to Gaza or maybe to some other conflicts. Because actually, when you are losing in one, then ah, you can try but, you to know, induce you, more chaos. You asked me a question, which I didn't answer. <laughs> I gave a long answer. If there but, is a way but, out. No, no, but you asked me a question, what to do. And, and the point I would make is the first thing we should do is stop raising the ante, you know? Stop saying, oh, we're going to defeat them. It's easy. Uh, we're going we're gonna to beat them. No, Ukraine's not going to defeat Russia. And the more that this goes on, the more dead Ukrainians there are. That's just the most basic point. And the whole society has been so profoundly wounded because millions and millions of Ukrainians are in Europe or are in Russia, and hundreds of thousands are dead because of this. So the population has collapsed and there aren't young people anymore. Now they want to draft kids 
and young women because they've run out of soldiers. It's terrible. And so we need to stop raising the ante. Now, what would that mean? We need to negotiate. We need to say first, okay, NATO is not enlarging. But Russia, you have to stop taking more and more Ukraine. And what the Russians are going to say at this point is, okay, we keep the following territories. And we're going to have to negotiate over that because the idea that, no, we don't make any concessions, you're just going to be defeated, is going to end up destroying all of Ukraine. It's, it's raising the stakes on a lousy hand. And we should recognize that we are going to need a political outcome right now, not the one we wanted, but we were so dumb not to take a better deal a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that now we're in a situation where we're not going to get exactly what we, quote, want. But to continue the fighting would absolutely destroy even more. Mm -hmm. What worries me most is actually that really the, the lives of Ukrainians are just taken as a, as a casualty, as something not even worth speaking about. They don't as... even talk about it. The no. leadership no. is absolutely gross. You know, I look, I, I'm sure that uh, Zelensky is in a very hard place, but all he talks about right now is throwing more lives to the graves. Frankly, no strategy. No self-awareness, no situational awareness. Okay, it's very sad because the United States talked him out of a peace agreement in March 2022. That was Zelensky's chance, and he lost it. He was inexperienced. You know, when you the United States comes and tells you, we have your back, you you know, you tend to believe it if you're inexperienced. I tried to tell him, by the way, I, you know. I, I really tried to tell the Ukrainians, look, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. I've been through lots of U.S. wars, Vietnam War, Nicaragua, uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, Syria. They never win. Are you kidding? Do you really want to end up like Afghanistan? And oh. they didn't believe me. They just thought, oh, you're a Putin apologist. Uh, so they didn't want to hear any of this. But I was telling them the hard facts about American wars, and they didn't want to hear it. Uh, besides Russia, I, I'm not sure that Ukraine actually is such a big topic uh, in uh, in American uh, policy. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, uh, it's, maybe, it's maybe definitely the minute, You know, it's a big focus of the political class still, the military industrial complex and the White House. Maybe for just political reasons that uh, Biden doesn't want to admit what a lousy poker player he is. But the, the point is, uh, for the American people, they've had enough. There's no groundswell of support. People don't want that. They want to stop this thing. And so in that sense, you're absolutely right. Typically, the public doesn't have much say in this. We have almost no public debate. But Biden's popularity is really collapsing. And if the uh, unhappiness with Biden's foreign policy is very, very clear. So maybe even public opinion is going to start playing a role because we're now in an election year. Um, I would like to ask you to clear the position on China, because when I look both at the Republicans or at the Democrats, I would say that their views on China are very similar. So they actually have very hostile views uh, towards China. Uh, now there was a summit, uh, APEC, where uh, both presidents, Biden and Xi Jinping, met. Um, do you see any, any decline in tension, any hopes that actually the relations, they are probably not going to be friendly, but let's say at least stabilize and, and would be less, less threatening for the world? I'll tell you an interesting thing. When uh, President Xi came to this APEC summit in San Francisco, he met uh, 200 U.S. business leaders and they gave him a standing ovation. I don't think they would give an American president a standing ovation, but they gave President Xi a standing ovation. Why? China's their biggest market. 
they both produce in China, they sell in China, they make a lot of money in China, and they want normal relations. What, what is happening is two things. One, we have a kind of security class in America who uh, are all about uh, American dominance, American hegemony, America being number one. It's a very strange group of people. Uh, but this is uh, our foreign policy establishment. Then we have politicians who basically uh, think that, and it's very particular, uh, Trump in 2016 won the election by winning swing states in the middle of America, in the American Midwest, which is our industrial zone. And he won it by saying, China took your jobs away. Oh. And when he made narrow victories in those states, the Democrats said, oh, we have to attack China in order to compete politically with Trump. So there are two reasons for the anti-China sentiment in the United States. One, and in the political class, one is this idea of America being the only dominant country. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know, unless you're playing a board game like the game of risk, you don't get to be the dominant country in the world when there are other big countries around. So this is arrogance, again, very misguided. Then there is this protectionist politics, uh, which uh, tries to appeal to a few swing states in the U.S. elections. The upshot of this is that the political class both Democrats and Republicans are pretty united against China, pretty ignorant from my experience. They don't know China. Oh. They don't know Chinese history. They don't have any perspective. They play a dangerous game, like when uh, our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, flew to Taiwan. Oh. So stupid. Sorry. Just why do you want to provoke Another Thank superpower. you. Thank you for saying that. Because no, we so have the same stupid. representatives who are also provoking China no. in this in this country. No. Uh, okay, don't provoke China. Be respectful. Just have normal relations. Don't provoke a superpower. Why? What is in it to poke a superpower? Mm -hmm. It's stupid. People should think, you yeah. know, if there's some even if you think there's a bully, which China's not, but if you think there's a bully in the schoolyard and you're a, you know, a little kid and you think they're the bully, is it really smart to go poking them and say, you're a bully, I hate you? No, you're going to get hurt in the end. So you need some common sense. And China's not even bullying. China is just big, successful, dynamic actually a good trade partner for Europe. So we should treat it normally, respectfully. And uh, the U.S. anxieties should not be Europe's anxieties. This is another area where European politicians mm -hmm. are just repeating the words of American politicians. And you know, I know behind the scenes, it's although it's obvious, you know, why does van der Leyen repeat words almost like Biden, because she feels that her job is to be with the United States. Maybe she hopes the United States appoints her as the Secretary General of NATO or something. I don't know oh, what goodness. it is. No, but that's what, what she hopes, maybe. So this is where Europe makes a big mistake, just like it did make a big mistake in Ukraine. It would make a big mistake of trying to make an enemy out of China. That's a completely ridiculous losing proposition. Um, uh, my last question, because time, our time is coming up, I have to reflect one very current event you already mentioned, and that's uh, the elections in Argentina. Yes. Because let's say that uh, the elected president is an unusual personality. Um, how, how do you view this situation? Um, is there a danger for, for BRICS or, or maybe for other Latin American countries with his very strange suggestions as for foreign policy, as for economics. 
Yeah, of course, time will tell. One thing is uh, he won the presidency, but has uh, no uh, control over the Congress. Uh, his small parties, and at least for the moment, doesn't have any kind of governing coalition in the Congress. So maybe his uh, ability to uh, do things will require a much broader coalition of forces, and that could be a, a constraint. But <laughs> let me just say first, Argentina is a country that has been unstable for its whole history, going back to the 1820s, ever since independence. Argentina has messed up more currencies, had more inflation and more instability than any other place on the entire planet. This guy won not because of what he says, but because of disgust with the outgoing government which was delivering inflation of triple digits, uh, more than 100%. You can't really win an election when inflation is a triple digit. And I know Argentina quite well uh, and actually worked with the finance minister just before this one. And he ended up, he was doing a good job and he ended up being not forced out. He resigned, unfortunately, uh, but he resigned because his own, I would say, corrupt politicians in his own party were uh, rejecting the normal policies that he was trying to promote. So Argentina is now in yet another cycle of instability. Uh, all my professional career as an economist, I've been watching Argentina in amazement because it's it's not an impoverished country by any means, and it's you know got huge natural wealth and uh, mm. and very smart people, um, well educated uh, class of people, but it has made such a political mess repeatedly, and this mm. could be yet another one. I don't want to say on the first day after the election of uh, this guy that he'll really govern the way he campaigned, because sometimes they become a lot more responsible, but it could be that he's, <laughs> that he is what he says he is, in which case uh, Argentina is going to face some real troubles. I don't, I, it, it's regrettable because I'm, I'm a, a fan of the BRICS. I would like to see them work. Argentina is a new member of the BRICS group. Uh, whether this guy stays in or out of the bricks or gets kicked out of the bricks, everything remains to be seen. Uh, but I, uh, I only hope that this guy was making this as a persona, not as a real politics, because uh, his real politics, uh, if delivered this way, would be very very detrimental to Argentina.